All right, welcome back, Doc D. Uh, it's just 101 uh, Quality Management Part 2. And so this is part of a three-part series talking about quality management. And uh, so uh, in the earlier uh, part one, we talked about um, Philip Crosby. And uh, so he had... Uh, uh, four uh, tenets to his uh, zero defects fo uh, philosophy. Uh, quality means conformance to requirements, not goodness. Uh, quality is achieved by prevention, not appraisal. And uh, I had quite a long discourse uh, about that in that uh, while prevention is absolutely uh, essential, uh, we also have to have periodic appraisal as well. Uh, to identify um, different uh, tendencies that uh, where tolerances might drift or, or, or so forth and so on. Um, quality has performance standard of zero defects, um, not acceptable quality levels, and then quality is measured uh, by the price of nonconformance, not indexes. And so we will continue on uh, talking about uh, that and um, we uh, also talked uh, briefly about uh, Crosby's 14 steps to creating quality. And then uh, we did some introspection about your own um, beliefs on quality and how you, how you define something as being quality and what that, what that actually looks like and, and why you might say something was quality and something else was not of good quality. Um, we actually define quality, uh, and uh, so we uh, looked at the characteristics of a product or service that bear on its ability to satisfy stated or implied needs. And so, again, you know, just to reiterate that uh, quality is based upon meeting requirements, and those requirements are specified by the customer. All right, we talked briefly about the uh, history of quality. Um, you know, we talked about the overlap of dimming uh, in the 30s and 40s, and then um, then we had uh, Crosby coming in in the early 50s uh, as a local guy in, in Richmond, Indiana, and in Mishawaka, Indiana. Um, all right, let's see. And so there we go. All right, so. So I talked about um, uh, prevention is, uh, quality is about prevention, not appraisal. And, and so we also have to have that appraisal in there. And that appraisal, again, as I stated earlier, is that, um, you know, you periodically are having to um, take stuff off the assembly line, inspect it, measure it, and check it to make sure that it meets the requirements or uh, you also need to track changes uh, because changes occur. Uh, it's just a natural state of life that as something uh, continues to produce parts, the machine itself wears, the tooling wears, and then so periodically uh, if we are doing this appraisal portion of this, um, we will notice the trend in drift in dimensional tolerances. And so if we catch it early enough, we can take preventative steps, uh, as in uh, retooling the machine, uh, overhauling the machine, buying a new machine, um, so forth and so on. All right, so sources of quality errors. And this is not an all-inclusive list, all right, but uh, it does hit the big five, all right. And so, and I just talked a little bit about this. So tooling, uh, no matter what type of thing that you're making, uh, there's some type of tooling uh, that creates that part. All right, and obviously this doesn't uh, apply to the service industry because you know there's no tooling there. But uh, in, in and again, you know, I'm talking from the manufacturer's perspective, in that anytime there's tooling, all right, the tooling has to interact with the workpiece or the raw materials, and so uh, as it does that, uh, the tooling is going to wear. 
And so as the tooling wears, what happens is, is that we start to see uh, surface finishes start to become uh, less nice. They become more porous, uh, rougher. Uh, dimensional accuracy starts to diminish. Uh, because the machine still thinks that the tool is the same size, but because of the gradual wearing away, um, the part dimension actually grows um, or shrinks, depending on what, uh, which part of the part you're talking about. Uh, we also talked a little bit about the machines themselves. So uh, as the machines themselves wear, they have moving parts, and any time that you have moving parts, you have friction, and with friction comes wear. And so... Uh, things that we can do to influence that is, you know, to have a, um, a preventative maintenance routine for all of our machines and tooling uh, so that we are periodically inspecting and making upgrades and changing out lubricants and cleaning. And, and all of that actually does contribute to our ability to hold tight tolerances for quality. All right. Uh, but even with all of that, even with the most... Um, stringent um, preventative maintenance, uh, you're still going to have wear uh, of your tooling. You're still going to have wear on your machines. And also, you know, you will have you'll have breakage uh, from time to time of tools, of machines, uh, and so forth. All right. And so, you know, again, we want to have this quality management instilled at every level so that every person who's working on that particular part has quality management uh, in their mind, not necessarily foremost. Safety is always foremost, but probably number two is we're thinking about, you know, every part that we make should be uh, the best that we can make it. All right, and again, this ties in with uh, W. Edwards Deming and, uh, you know, when he talked about uh, having a unified vision uh, across the company and, and so I mean it, the these theories that uh, or, or philosophies and principles that that Deming introduced they they dovetail very nicely uh, with what um, Crosby's talking about all right so all right going back to sources of quality errors uh, source materials uh, depending on you uh, and so some of the most uh, stringent quality control uh, policies, procedures, whatever, they actually will require certification from the manufacturers of the source materials that it meets certain specifications. So those specifications might be that um, it has a high dimensional tolerance, meaning that when you get the actual raw material, it's in a specified form uh, within specified tolerances, meaning that it's within plus or minus you know, one or two thousandths, or maybe even less. Um, uh, the source materials, you know, the, the uh, composition of the source materials themselves uh, would be certified. Uh, an example of this would be uh, in the construction industry, uh, you know, when you're building a, uh, a building, you know, say you're going to build a skyscraper. Well, they actually will take from every single pour that they do, they will take a series of, uh, uh, of additional pours from that material. They'll pour it into little buckets. They'll let those buckets uh, set up. And then those buckets then are destructively tested to see that the concrete actually meets the requirements for what it was advertised as. And so, you know, it'll have um, tensile strength uh, of so many hundred thousand psi pounds per square inch uh, and so on and so what they're doing and again you know prevention the prevention side of that is that you know we're making them specify we're specifying what the material must be and the requirements that it must meet but we also have to have the appraisal side of that whereas we're actually testing the material as it comes now the downside of that is is that we're testing after the pour Right. But it's much better to identify then that, you know, hey, the next day when we uh, destructively test these cylinders that we poured at the same time and find out, oh, this concrete doesn't have the tensile strength that it's supposed to have. Well, they're going to have to go in and tear all that stuff out. All right. Uh, but there really there's no other way to do it. But much better to find out then than at the end of the uh, construction project when we have you know, 15, 20 million dollars invested in a building and then find out that 
the base structure of it, the base concrete uh, foundation um, is not up to par. All right. So source materials can contribute a lot of quality errors because you know if you have a manufacturer who's delivering something that it's not and your requirements uh, rely upon what they've certified it to be and it's not well then you find yourself in, in a very bad place and so that's why we have to have the prevent the preventative side in that we're we're making specifications uh, requirements to the vendor. The vendor then is saying, yeah, here are the specifications of the material that we're providing. And then we have the appraisal side of that where we go in and we actually test it to make sure that it is what they say it is. All right. Um, workers are, uh, it can be a source of quality error. And I would say probably roughly half the time the worker is um, the source of the quality error. Uh, what are some of the reasons why they might be um, the source of the error? Um, inattention, you know, if you're doing the same thing day in and day out uh, for years at a time, you know, you, you get to the point where you're just on autopilot and, you know, you're not even looking at what you're really doing. You just throw a piece in and go and, you know, and you just, you're counting the seconds until that one's done and you can move on to the next, right? Uh, but, you know, those workers need to be trained on quality management. Uh, again, we need to have that cohesive vision that uh, goes from the bottom all the way to the top, uh, the supervisors need to be trained um, and to make sure that their workers are doing what they're supposed to be doing and, you know, finding ways to address the monotony of doing the same job every single day, uh, you know, and there are trade-offs with that. So, you know, if, if a worker does the same job every single day, uh, they become very good at it, all right, and, you know, they develop uh, repetitive motion skills uh, so that it becomes muscle memory and uh, you know they're very fast and very efficient and so if you put somebody new into that position they don't have that muscle memory and so you know that it actually winds up slowing down the entire process all right um, so you know how do we how do we address um, the fact that you know the worker does the same thing day in day out all right, you know, one of the things that uh, I've always been a firm believer is in cross training so that, you know, workers are familiar with several different uh, work areas and are able to drop in at a moment's notice on one or the other. Uh, the downside of that is, is that they don't develop that uh, very acute, fine level of detail that they did if they did the exact same job every single day. Uh, but it also instills some variability in their life and, uh, you know, allows them uh, some flexibility as well. It also pays big dividends if a worker calls in sick. I've got somebody else that I could take from another process into there. All right, and then damage. Uh, damage can come from all of the things that we already talked about as far as the tooling damage, machines damage themselves as they work, um, source materials and packaging and transition. Uh, very, very common that uh, as uh, things are shipped, and I'm sure that everybody can relate, you know, as you've gotten a box from Amazon or, or wherever, that, you know, you get a box that just looks like it was beat with a baseball bat. Well, that happens to source materials as well, and it also happens to uh, final products as it ships on out the door. And so, you know, one of the things, that, one of the tenets of quality is to, to look at that, you know. Uh, that quality extends from the time that we make it to the time that it reaches our customer. And so what are we doing to make sure that our finished product arrives un unharmed? And so, you know, there are, there are uh, many companies that I've dealt with that they package materials very, very well. And, and they charge, usually they charge a, a, a pretty penny to do so. But, you know, the part that arrives is undamaged, even though the, the crating that, it's, that it was packaged in is just beat to smithereens. All right. So... Those are all things. You know, workers can cause inadvertent damage. Um, you can also have workers who cause purposeful damage just because, you know, they are uh, they don't feel loved. They don't feel like uh, they're contributing. And so, you know, it's not unheard of for workers to sabotage an assembly line so that maybe they can get some downtime to do whatever. All right. And again, you know, this that's where this whole... Uh, unified vision and then having workers that are trained, having supervisors that are trained uh, so that, you know, we can identify these things right up front and take preventative actions. All right.
All right, so here we're going to talk. Uh, so we're going to talk about the four principles uh, from uh, Crosby. All right. So uh, quality is conformance to requirements, all right, not goodness. Okay, quality is not goodness, not elegance, luxury, excellence. All right. Uh, we, those are our subjective terms. All right. What's luxury to me may not be luxury to you. What's elegant to me may not be elegant to you. All right. Those are very subjective terms, and so we want to we want to uh, be objective in how we assess this. All right. So you know, with the uh, definition as he poses it, you know, quality is conformance to requirement. There isn't any doubt when we've achieved we've either achieved quality or we haven't. All right. Um, so when we write our requirements, and again, we're going to have a, another whole lecture, uh, maybe two, dealing with writing good requirements, and there will actually be uh, a writing requirements assignment as well. Um, but if we write those requirements correctly, all right, it's either a yes or no. It is either is or it is not. All right. And then, you know, so the second bullet there, we can defend our product because we can point out to why we did what we did. You know, again, if we're using objective means, it either is or it isn't. All right, there's no doubt. There's no, um, there's no wiggling around about it. All right. Whereas if we use these subjective terms, you know, elegant, luxury, excellence, goodness, etc. You know, how do you define it? How do you, how do you define that from one person to the next and have, and not have ambiguity? All right. So the implication to this is that requirements must be known and clearly stated and properly stated. All right. Um, so writing this, the, the whole process of writing good requirements is really is an art form. And so, uh, you know, there are some people who are very good at it and are naturals at it. Other people struggle. Um, yeah. So and then the you know, next bullet there, perform exactly as required. Uh, or officially change the requirement. So if you can't meet the requirement, all right, you go back in and you say, you know, okay, is the requirement, is the requirement the issue? Is it too stringent? All right. And so the requirement may be that it does this uh, with a, a ceiling of X amount of dollars, right? Well, you can do just about anything all right, if you have enough money. All right, but you know, people don't want to spend. Typically, don't want to spend the big money to meet requirements. They want to. They want to specify very stringent requirements, and they want to pay for uh, something that is much, much less. All right, enables accountability, uh, management, workers, uh, suppliers, consumers, the whole train of the process. You know, from the consumers who. Uh, are certifying the products that they're sending to us as raw materials to the workers who are uh, transporting, uh, machining, making, assembling, packing, uh, and ultimately delivering the the product. All right, and then of course you know we we have to have the management, the leadership side of that as well um, to uh, make sure that this is all happening. And then again to track trends and to take proactive action when it's needed. All right, so this is just an exercise that uh, take a few minutes to do. Uh, you don't need to submit this. I just want you to think about it. Again, I, I'm much more interested in you going through the process than what your end result is. All right. So if quality is conformance to requirements, what requirements do you have and what is conformance? All right, and so we're going to look at a coffee shop. Uh, we'll call it a jumping bean because we all have familiarity with that. At least we've walked by it, if nothing else. All right, so when we're uh, thinking about requirements, all right, we have to think about objective. All right, and so here's some examples. Uh, a requirement that the average wait time in line is less than three minutes at all times except lunch hour from 12 to 1. Okay, and so that's that's objective. You know, I could step in line, I could start my stopwatch, and you know, at three minutes, I've either been waited on or I haven't been. All right, so they either met the requirement or they didn't. 
if they didn't, and then, you know, this is where we we, we would <laughs> look at our code here and say, you know, oh, uh, is it between 12 and 1? Okay, and if it is, then, okay, then they still they might still have met the requirements, all right? Um, so conformance would be a measurement over several days of time of wait time for each customer. And, and again, so, the, you know, they're doing data sampling is what they're saying, is that, you know, you come in line and you're data sampling. So if we have one time where a uh, customer didn't didn't meet their that three minute wait time, less than three minute wait time, all right, did they blow the requirements? Um, maybe, maybe not. All right. Uh, technically, they did blow the requirements, but you know, was there an external factor that factored into that? Maybe the power went off. All right. Well, if the power went off, obviously, I can't expect them to be able to meet this three minutes because they've got no way to process uh, orders. They got no way to process money. They have no way to actually create the drinks. All right. And then, you know, average wait time should be less than three minutes for each day. So, you know, again, we're doing data sampling and, you know, and I, and, and this would be a specified thing. All right. Uh, so, so a requirement would be, could be written that, um, you know, no patron should wait more than three minutes to be waited upon, except during lunch or one. Uh, if it's written that way, then guess what? Uh, yeah, okay, average wait. I'm sorry, when you read the original one, it says the average waiting time. All right. But it could, again, it could be written that no patron should wait more than three minutes. If they waited more than three minutes, all right, they blew the requirement. All right. On this one, you know, they're showing an average wait time. So, you know, if you had one person who went three and a half minutes, even one who went ten, all right, they would still meet the requirements. But, again, this is where that whole writing of good requirements is. All right. And so... You know, for, for me, this is kind of a Boolean logic thing uh, in that if I were writing the requirements for this, um, yeah, I'd like to have an average wait time under three minutes, uh, but I would also uh, specify a, an upper end of that, and no customer should ever wait more than 10 minutes. You know, as an example, I don't know whether that, that would be doable or not, but I'm just saying that, you know, so when you write these requirements, you know, you're specifying as the customer... All right, because you're 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 writing the requirements that somebody is going to try to fill. All right. All right, and the cost of nonconformance. All right, so if we're not meeting that requirement, we lose business. People get mad, they leave. Um, we suffer uh, to our um, our reputation takes a hit because you know uh, if you've ever seen the uh, oh what is it. Um, so if, you, if a person has a bad experience in a store, you know, they'll go and they'll tell 10 people and then those 10 people will tell 10 people and so forth and so on, right? It grows exponentially. Well, that certainly applies here. Uh, but, you know, on the flip side of that, <laughs> if something good happens, you know, they might tell one or two people, you might tell one or two, you know, it's, but, you know, we, we have to think about that and we have to keep in mind that, you know, the, the cost of nonconformance is that, you know, we suffer a blow to our reputation. Uh, in a coffee shop, you know, that might not be such a huge thing. Uh, but we also, you know, let's, let's talk about, say, Amazon, for example. If uh, all of a sudden Amazon uh, stopped hitting their two-day delivery, you know, and nobody was getting things in their two-day, what would happen to Amazon? What would happen to their reputation? You know, they would take a huge hit and... You know, so what happens when their reputation takes a huge hit? Well, stock prices start to start to drop. People start selling stock, all right? And so, you know, the next thing you know is that Amazon takes a huge hit financially uh, because of this hit on reputation, all right? And so that's really what he's talking about is the cost of nonconformance. All right, let's see. All right, the system of quality is prevention. This was his second tenant there. All right, and again, he says not appraisal, but you cannot have uh, quality management with prevention alone. You absolutely must have appraisal in there as well. All right, prevention should be foremost. We should be a tenant of 
uh, every worker's uh, view and vision. All right? But you have to have appraisal because um, without that, you know, you don't you don't have an opportunity to identify some of the problems before they become a problem. All right. All right. So here he talks about create a system that prevents problem. Um, you know, if temperature of food is critical, monitor it. Well, guess what? That monitoring it is what? It's appraisal. All right. Just because I turn the, uh, uh, the refrigerator to 40 degrees, all right, and then I assume that it's going to stay 40 degrees, I have, to, I have to do appraisal. I have to go in and I have to check it periodically. And I should do that, you know, on, on a fairly frequent level. You know, speaking from the, the food service industry, which I've done that myself, um, you know, if food sits in a, a, uh, an unrefrigerated place, for more than an hour or so, guess what? It's probably spoiled, and then it goes. All right. Uh, if software bugs are critical, catch them and report them. All right. Catch them and fix them. All right. Um, do things right the first time, obviously. And it just goes back again to that unified vision. Uh, if we've got all the workers that are on the same vision, and um, you know they're they're moving forward with the creating the best product that they can create all right we're going to try to do things right the first time all right so now he says go, not going to rely solely on catch a problem and fix it again we have to have that appraisal in there all right because even though everybody is working and trying to do things right the first time there are unaccountable things that can sneak into our production process that unless we're doing some type of appraisal we will never catch all right. So how do we do this? Um, management must set clear requirements, all right, and then communicate those requirements. Probably one of the biggest things I've ever seen is that um, the management will understand the requirements, but they don't communicate it down to the people who are actually doing the work. And so the people doing the work, they don't see the significance of what it is that they're doing on the quality management side. And so, you know, we talk about this implementing this common vision from bottom to top. But if they don't understand exactly what it is that they're doing, then how can we expect them to prioritize it? All right. So we've got to train workers. We have to coach them. And this also works for management. Management has to be trained. They have to be coached. All right. Where else are they going to learn how to do this with their workers? So this goes all the way to the top of the company, and there should be a nurturing, fostering environment uh, all the way down, from the top down. All right, so the CEO fosters and nurtures people below him who foster and nurture people below them all the way down to the base level employee who's actually doing the work. All right, we have to provide the actual tools. We have to provide good quality tools. All right, and so we have to provide the tools to actually do the, um, the processing, the building, the creating, uh, and we also have to provide the tools for the appraisal as well. So when we go in, so we, we say that we're going to go in and we're going to periodically check material as it comes off the production line, well, we have to have tools, all right, to do that, all right? We have to have very well-designed tools so that, you know, the worker doesn't have to think a whole lot about it. They can drop something in and say, yeah, it either fits or doesn't fit, all right? And that's that whole, um, uh, now, shoot, I just lost my chain of thought. Anyhow, moving on. Uh, give workers control. Again, you know, once we educate them and we coach them and we teach them and train them, all right, we have to give them the power to affect change. And you'll find that if we give the workers the power to affect change, they have very insightful um, views and information because they are the, peers, uh, are the people that are down there doing the work. They are the ones who are first going to identify that, hey, there might be a problem. Something's not working the way that it's supposed to. All right. And then we also need to be able to hold people accountable. And whether that be workers or management or whatever, um, we have to have some type of system that recognizes people who are doing exemplary. Uh, we also have to have a system that recognizes people who uh, are missing the mark. And if they're missing the mark, we need to be able to train and coach them uh, so that they can make the mark. 
right? And then, of course, we need to monitor and fix processes that create problems. And, right? and so this monitor and fix processes that create problems, there's a whole bunch of those different things that can create problems. Uh, can be people-to-people -people interaction, people-to-machine uh, to interaction, people-to-material interaction, uh, a lot of different things there that we can look at. And so, again, we have to have this totalitarian view of this whole quality management going from the very bottom all the way to the top. Everybody involved, all right? And so that if a worker sees something that they think is contributing to a problem or could contribute to a crop problem, we want them to have the power to start to implement change, whether that be just as simple as saying to their supervisor, hey, I noticed that X, Y, and Z is happening, and I think that this is going to create a problem, or it is creating a problem. And a lot of times, you know, because they're the person who's down there actually doing this day in, day out, um, they will have insightful views on how they might address that said problem. All right. Whew. That's a lot of talking. <laughs> All right, let's see. What do we got next? Uh, da, 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 da. So that was two. All right, building quality throughout the process, part of the total quality management process. Uh, there are several um, quality management indexes out there. Um, uh, the, the Sigma, uh, the Black Belt series, uh, TQM, uh, there, there are several of them out there. All right. and, they, and they all are a systemized, organized uh, process of addressing quality concerns and, and from, from the bottom all the way to the top. All right. And so, you know, the whole goal of this is to, um, number one, identify what specifically the requirements should be or are. Can we meet those requirements? Uh, and then to, um, to track when we're starting to depart from meeting those requirements, when we actually do not meet the requirements, and then to take uh, proactive actions from that point. All right, the performance standard is zero defects. And again, as I said uh, right up front in this, is that, you know, when I first read this, I thought, man, that's just, you know, zero defects costs a lot of money, all right? It is achievable, all right, but it costs a lot of money, all right? So zero defects means that you make the product that satisfies the requirements exactly as written. If it says we'll get 38 miles per gallon, and it should, uh, yeah. Zero defects should be the manager's expectation for how the product is built or delivered. Clear, simple, unambiguous statement. Again, we're trying to be objective. Well, we're not trying. We are objective. All right. And then any other standard that says that making mistakes is okay. So here's the thing that, that I have to add to this is that to err is human. Uh, we will all make mistakes. Uh, computers make mistakes. Machines make mistakes. All right. Most of the time, those are uh, human uh, initiated. But to think that you can have a, a manufacturing environment or actually any type of environment that provides a product or service without mistakes, you can't do it. All right. There, there is no such thing. All right. Now that doesn't. Uh, affect the fact that we should expect no mistakes, all right? Uh, we want to drive towards that, all right? But we also need to realize that, you know, there, there are going to be mistakes. <laughs> and just as I said, hey, you got to be kidding. People aren't perfect. We're human. We make mistakes, right? All right. So, here in, I'm, I'm totally, you know, right here, I got it. And then, so what happens? So the next slide will talk a little bit about uh, an industry where zero defects really is the rule of thumb. And, and, and 
I think you will agree once you once you read the slide and and, and have a chance to, to process that. So let's go ahead and bring that up. <laughs> All right, so there we've got an American Airlines plane on the ground. All right, you're probably already seeing where this is going, right? Oops. So, would you take a commercial flight? All right. So, Atlantis Hartsfield handles 800,000 flights a year. 99.9% .9 equals two crashes a day at Atlanta alone. All right. Is that is that palatable? No. No, it's not. Um, you know, 50 new un, new excuse me, 50 newborn babies dropped in the living room every day. All right. Are are those are those palatable? You know, is that something that you could live with? No, absolutely not. All right. And so there are times when, you know, the zero defect is absolutely inherently must be. All right. And so the aviation industry is one of those, you know. Uh, there still are defects, right? But they're such a small percentage. All right. You know, so, yeah, uh, you're never going to be error free. You're always going to have some type of error but you know throughout the airline industry you know there's checks and rechecks and triple checks and you know everything is inspected before each and every flight all right again so they've got this whole quality management from every single person who works on an aircraft whether it be somebody who is loading passengers to somebody who's loading cargo um, to the baggage handlers all right every single person has a direct impact on this zero defect policy in the airline industry, you know. And so, you know, even the people who load the luggage inside of the airplane, you know, you think, oh, wow, you know, what a simple job. But you know what? That all has to be balanced. <clears throat> and there are, in the shipping industry, it's very, very common for ships to be uh, loaded in a way that's not balanced. And so what happens when they start to hit some large waves is that maybe the load shifts or um, anyhow it's out of balance and once it comes out of balance and it counterbalances too far, you then have a rollover, all right? Well, it's not such a big deal in the shipping industry because, you know, you can swim, but if that should happen while you're 30,000 feet in the air, uh, none of us have learned how to fly yet. All right, moving on. Okay, the measure, the fourth principle here, uh, the measurement of quality is the price of nonconformance. And we talked a little bit about this. Um, so let's go ahead and get these going. All right, as I've stated, you know, it could cost money. Uh, if an inspector sees a damaged box, they must fix it. Uh, if, the cons if the consumer gets a bad product, then not only do we have to pit, cover the shipping to get our product back, but we also have to ship a new product out. And then the product that comes back, what do we do with it? Do we rework it? Do we uh, trash it? Do we recycle it? Whatever. Um, you know, cost money. You know, um, if somebody buys a product from you and it's so bad that they're never going to buy anything from you again, all right, how much money does that translate to? Uh, you know, so... Um, an example would be Nike. You know, many people feel very, very strongly um, about uh, Nike's stance with uh, Colin Kaepernick. All right, and so there are a lot of people who've just said, you know what, you, you guys aren't aren't having a vision that that fits with what we want, and so you know they're taking a huge hit to their reputation, and it's ultimately going to cost them money. All right, you can translate mistakes into dollar terms all right management understands the costs and are motivated by any direct impact on the bottom line well everything that has to do with uh, quality does impact the bottom line so you know even something as simple as you know you saw a box on the shipping line that wasn't uh, correctly packed and you fixed that well it costs money to do that but you know it also saves money and so you know 
it's really hard to see the direct cost to that and it's also hard to see the indirect cost uh, price of non-conformance must also factor in a loss of future sales and again you know I said this several times that if you become a company who is known for not delivering on what you said you will your reputation will take a beating and people will stop buying from you and, and so you know there is a huge cost associated with that and, and you know and I just talked about um, you know if you ship a product out to somebody and it's damaged or whatever all right you've got to get that product back you know to do the right thing you have to get that product back and you have to replace that product in a timely manner all right and then you know so now you've got double the cost in product plus shipping both ways and you've got this other piece of product that now you have to do something with all right and so you know large large amounts of uh, resources get sucked up into this all right and so here's really kind of what I've been saying is that you know it transdirects uh, defects into actual dollar terms all right you know anytime that there's an error or a mistake it costs money well, if we catch that mistake in-house, it still costs money, but it costs a whole lot less money. And we'll talk a little bit later, uh, probably in our next lecture series, <laughs> about um, how this does save us money. Um, so zero defects does cost money, but it saves money as well. Uh, the purpose of calculating cost of quality is really only to get management attention to provide a measurement base for seeing how quality improvement is doing and, and what that doesn't say is then taking proactive measures to address uh, any drift all right so let's see where are we at right now we are 42 minutes in on the lecture I think I'm probably just going to go ahead and call it there um, you have a homework assignment that is going to be due uh, Friday, uh, what is the, the 6th, I think? Hold on a second. Maybe not the 6th. Friday the 3rd, sorry. Um, that is on Moodle. Uh, so, anyhow, um, Doc D signing off. I hope that everybody is healthy. I uh, hope these lessons are, are helpful and meaningful to you. Uh, please do leave comments down below on anything that I can do to help your learning experience. Doc D out.